Good morning, everyone. I am pleased to join you today along with Brent Roussin. Dr. Roussin, as you know, is the Chief Provincial Public Health Officer, and with Lynette Saragusa, who is the Chief Integration Officer for Shared Health, uh, both, of course, in leadership positions on our incident command structure in the province of Manitoba. I'm Cameron Friesen, your Minister of Health, Seniors and Active Living, and we're pleased to provide additional information today on planning and preparation for COVID-19 in the province. Uh, of course, today I will start my, uh, my remarks by indicating again Again, our sincere and unqualified thanks to all the Manitobans who are in the health care system who are uh, on the front line, who are working hard every day, uh, who are putting patients first, uh, who care. Thank you for your efforts. Thank you for your commitment. And also uh, to our leadership team, to those uh, senior leaders in the healthcare system who are leading the charge on this. Uh, extraordinary work by an extraordinary group of people and uh, Manitobans can have full assurance that their interests are being uh, fully supported and met uh, through this hard working group at the incident command structure and through them to their respective teams. Uh, decisions, as you know, are being made swiftly right now. The situation is evolving very quickly uh, in the following, in, in the previous days and even continuing into today. I know that at times it can feel to Manitobans that the ground is shifting underneath their feet and we should not discount the, uh, the degree of anxiety that, uh, that seeing empty parking lots creates, that seeing empty uh, restaurants and empty theaters as you pass them on the street. This is exceptional. It's unusual and it creates anxiety. We need to acknowledge that. Uh, and what we would say to people is that while we acknowledge it, these efforts that we are undertaking are for a very important reason. And we know what that reason is, to flatten the curve on the spread of uh, COVID-19 in our communities, and that will help us to not be overwhelmed in our health care system. Essentially, we are trying to push the event longer by pushing the top down. And so far, we have such tremendous respect for the many Manitobans who are taking this seriously, who are taking the precautions, who are washing their hands according to the protocol, who are coughing and sneezing into their sleeve, who are not going to work when they are sick. And now in the previous days, of course, also heeding the advice of our chief to do things like limit their gatherings, stay out of crowds, to not hold play dates uh, for their children with many children in the home. Clearly, we need compliance of Manitobans. Uh, we need their cooperation, and we need their, co -op, uh, their compassion along the way as they think about the people around them as well. I want to talk about just a few ways in which the system has responded uh, and is making progress. Uh, as of today, we have nine community screening sites that are open, four in Winnipeg and then across the province, including the Brandon uh, Regional Health Center site, which just opened yesterday. I am pleased to report that the Steinbach site will open tomorrow. It will be a drive-through site site. In addition to this, we have another site opening in Winnipeg shortly, and that will be on Bison Drive. It will be at an MPI claims center, making use of that claims garage where, where uh, vehicles are assessed for damage. We've taken that. It's an excellent partnership uh, between MPI and the government, and we will have more information emerging on when that center will be open. Uh, we, uh, we have other rural locations, like I told you, Thompson, Flin Flon, and the Paw, and we have more locations that will continue uh, to uh, roll into effect in the coming days. Other news, we want to thank uh, Doctors Manitoba for their cooperation. Uh, together we have been able uh, to land on some rule changes that will offer virtual doctor visits and virtual psychotherapy options uh, which follow social distancing requirements. Essentially what we're doing is we're taking uh, activities that would have formerly been in person in an office and we're allowing them to be done now by telephone or by a remote video feed and of of course, uh, this is for not just diagnosis and treatment, but even prescription and prescription renewal. This is new, but all Manitobans can understand how important this is to help uh, observe social distancing instructions at this point in time. 
We've also reached an agreement with labor unions in health care, which is important. Uh, it allows for staff to be redeployed and moved into areas of surge as required. It's forward planning. It is contingency planning. And I just want to cite the fact that everyone came together and put patients first uh, in a plan that would provide certainty and ensure that staff will be there for patients. So our, uh, our thanks uh, for, that, uh, for that success. All uh, Manitoba health care facilities will be soon implementing additional precautions. And we have Lynette Saragusa here who will speak about those in a, a moment. They're there, of course, uh, to protect staff, to protect patients, and to protect uh, the community. These, of course, include the recent changes we have made uh, to restrict visiting in long-term care centers and personal care homes. And while we understand that that does place a strain on residents, and on their family and friends. Uh, we're asking for the creativity of Manitobans and the leadership of those who run those facilities to help establish other forms of contact between residents and the outside community. But we all understand the reasons for which we're undertaking those decisions. Uh, as part of our provincial efforts to ensure capacity for COVID-19, I want to state today that uh, changes are being undertaken at the Health Sciences Centre that would allow us to move some patients uh, into the previous women's pavilion. And this will allow us to have dedicated space uh, on the Health Sciences Centre campus specific to COVID-19 patients. I want to be clear, we do not need this capacity at the current time. We are planning ahead of time. And indeed, from other jurisdictions and countries, uh, we are learning the lessons uh, that uh, preparations should be made well in advance to make sure that capacity is there should it be required. These are just a few examples of how government is cooperating, collaborating, and leading uh, to keep Manitobans safe and to respond in a rapidly changing environment. Just a few things to add uh, to refresh the memories of Manitobans because it's important to consider what we've done in just a short space of time. I had the opportunity this morning to speak uh, and give uh, remarks to the Incident Command Structure Leadership Group and I told them it is truly remarkable uh, what we have done as a province in a very, very short time. Some of the things we've done include our decision to sign on to a uh, joint procurement purchase of protective equipment uh, for hospital workers and for patients. A $35 million purchase, we were the first to sign. We are well positioned with our ventilators. We had 243 ventilators in this province. I can update you today to indicate we have re just received 27 additional ventilators with more on the way. Uh, these are, as I said, unprecedented circumstances, and we're working fast. Uh, you have heard that in the retail sector, uh, government worked with the uh, Retail Council and with the Chambers of Commerce to be able to participate with grocery stores and pharmacy chains to be able to open for longer hours early in the day when the store is arguably cleaner, but specifically for seniors and vulnerable people uh, with uh, perhaps immune systems that are not as strong uh, so that they can also get what they need. Uh, we know that in the last week uh, uh, we had faculty of medicine students uh, from the University of Manitoba helping with occupational health services and we know that their efforts will continue. There were 10 fourth year nursing students who started working at HealthLink's InfoSante to help with the uh, volumes there. I can tell you that 89 physicians have already come forward to offer their services uh, and take on additional hours at clinics and hospitals. Uh, our government has moved very quickly to uh, purchase 100% uh, alcohol-based sanitizer for healthcare facilities on a bulk purchase. And of course, you've heard about our new self-assessment tool, which is online. Uh, it is helping to divert traffic from health links and get people important information and assessment. Uh, this tool had 53,000 hits yesterday alone. It is the result of partnerships that we have formed both within healthcare system and externally with other partners. 
Uh, I would also say that we have been able to add interactive voice response capability to Health Links that is providing additional information to people on the line. And in addition to this, the myriad of uh, offers of support from business, from industry, from community groups, from faith-based groups, from professionals, uh, as well as the many indications of support from individual to individual, from neighbor to neighbor, uh, which we know is essential in this case. I'll wrap up my remarks by saying the following. I, I want to tell Manitobans uh, that while we have endeavored to provide information in a timely way and keep them up to date, because it's important, I would all ask um, Manitobans to use their judgment when they watch the numbers come in because I know the numbers that we provide of the increased cases in Manitoba is a cause for concern. It creates anxiety to see those numbers rise. But I would suggest that the rise of the numbers is inevitable at this point. Uh, it is exponential as we see in other jurisdictions. But the numbers are also rising because our system is working, because we are undertaking testing, because people are working hard in the background. Our job, of course, is to make sure that as those numbers rise, people to know what to do to keep themselves safe, to keep their neighbors safe, their families safe, and the people they may not even know safe. We need the compliance of Manitobans. We need their cooperation. We need acts of compassion every day. And I thank Manitobans for their excellent partnership in all of this as we face a sometimes uncertain future uh, together. Uh, we're Manitobans, we're strong, we're capable, we're community-minded, and we will get through this. At this time, I want to go to Dr. Brent Roussin for his daily report. Brent? Good morning. Thank you. Uh, the total number of lab confirmed positive and presumptive positive cases in Manitoba remains at 17. Uh, that includes the two cases that were uh, reported out uh, late afternoon yesterday. Uh, of the 17 cases, one individual has been hospitalized with mild symptoms. This individual is stable at this time and we will monitor the situation closely uh, but will not uh, devolve any further information about this individual at this time. As to one case I've mentioned uh, yesterday, uh, we have not yet been able to uh, directly link this case to travel or link to a confirmed uh, case in Manitoba, although public health investigations uh, remain ongoing at this time. To date, more than 3,200 tests for COVID-19 have been performed at our CADM Provincial Lab. Uh, in order to support social distancing efforts and to reduce potential spread of the virus, uh, day programs through community living disability services for adults with intellectual disabilities have been asked to limit this service. As soon as possible, day services will only be offered to individuals who, who live with family members who could lose their job if the services were not continued, uh, are supported by home uh, share providers who can't provide care during daytime hours and where other arrangements are not possible and cannot be safely supported in their residence during daytime hours. Uh, clients and their family members uh, or care providers will receive further information as soon as possible on this. In particular, uh, I want to remind Manitobans uh, that now is a time for social distancing. This is not the time to go out in large groups, uh, in crowded spaces, uh, such as bars, restaurants, and, and large house parties. This is a, a broad recommendation uh, but this is in keeping with our social distancing strategies to really um, impact uh, the, uh, the spread of the, vi the virus in our communities. Uh, we really want to interrupt the transmission of virus in our communities and by distancing else ourselves from others uh, is the best way uh, to do that. Uh, both provincially and federally, we've recommended gatherings of more than 50 people be cancelled or postponed. I encourage people to stay home and practice good social distancing for the most part. Uh, keeping that two meters separation uh, from individuals is one of our best ways to maintain the social distancing and interrupt that transmission of the virus. This, do, do, this does mean not arranging play dates for your children. Uh, does, uh, it includes not attending gatherings outside your home, including faith-based gatherings. Uh, but remember, social distancing should not mean social isolation. 
ensure we're remaining connected with people, ensure we're being nice with people, and ensure that we're reaching out to the most vulnerable people in our communities. We've said it many times in the past that this is a time for action. If we haven't changed the way we're living day to day, uh, then we haven't implemented these social distancing strategies uh, and we're not uh, doing our part to reduce the spread of this virus. In saying that, we see many, many examples of Manitobans stepping up, uh, doing their part to limit this, engaging in social distancing, uh, changing events, postponing travel plans. Uh, these are all Manitobans uh, contributing uh, to uh, all of Manitobans' health. People are starting to share our credible information. And again, I remind people to go to our Manitoba government website on coronavirus. It's up to date and information for healthcare providers, for the general public, for employers, and is a great place to update yourself daily on uh, the developments of the coronavirus. All international travelers returning to Canada must self-isolate for 14 days upon their return to Canada. I cannot em emphasize the importance of this enough. Uh, almost all the cases in Canada have been related to international travel. Certainly in Manitoba, almost all are, have been shown directly related to international travel. Uh, so by reducing our travel plans, uh, by uh, self-isolating for 14 days upon return to Canada, is our best way to protect the people around you and the public. This includes healthcare providers. Healthcare providers must self-isolate for 14 days upon their return to Canada. Uh, they must report to occupational health services. Uh, should they be deemed to be essential workers, then we have certain processes in place uh, to ensure our essential services remain in place. But all returning travelers uh, who are healthcare workers must report this to their occupational health uh, providers. I want to talk again about testing uh, because this is an important issue. You see the lab really stepping up uh, with the amount of tests performed. Uh, you may have seen that nationally there's been a strain on testing and this includes Manitoba as well. We want to ensure that our tests are being utilized on individuals who actually need to be tested. So I cannot emphasize enough, people without symptoms do not need to be tested for COVID-19. Do not attend facilities for testing if you do not have symptoms. Healthcare providers should not submit simple uh, samples on individuals who have presented who do not have symptoms. So I know it may be disappointing if you do end up coming to a site and you're screened and not deemed to have returned from international travel and not have symptoms, we should not be testing you. Uh, that's why we advise people to call health links first. You can get credible information on whether you need to be tested or not. Uh, but our lab is strained. Uh, they're going to be um, prioritizing samples from inpatients right now, uh, very ill patients, healthcare workers, and as well as long-term facilities. Um, because of this uh, strain, uh, outpatient tests uh, may show a, a bit of a delay uh, over the next uh, uh, number of days. Uh, so again, we need to ensure that only the right people are getting tested. If you have mild symptoms of respiratory illness, please stay home. Stay home until your re uh, symptoms resolve. If you have recent return from international travel, you should be self-isolating at home uh, anyways. Uh, but if you develop symptoms, then call health links and they'll give you the best advice on whether to be tested or not. I know many Manitobans are worried about uh, COVID-19 and this pandemic. It's certainly understandable, uh, but like I said, fear and panic is contagious. Fear and panic is not going to help us against COVID-19. Our preparation, our use of credible information, and our actions right now, now is the time for action, will protect us against COVID-19. This is not the time for business as usual. This is the time for social distancing to make changes in our day-to-day -day lives. We always remind Manitobans that this situation is evolving rapidly. The pandemic uh, worldwide and in Canada 
the uh, situations are, are evolving right before our eyes. We often are required to make decisions without having perfect information on hand. Uh, we do our best to uh, be out ahead of this pandemic and protect the health of Manitobans in the best manners uh, we can. We will take any steps necessary to protect the health of Manitobans and our social distancing strategies uh, right now uh, have got us out ahead uh, of this before we have any documented um, community-based or sustained community-based transmission. At the end of the day, taking swift action uh, will help protect the health of Manitobans and we've already made a number of those me measures in place. Our schools and our daycares are winding down We'll be suspending classes at the end of day tomorrow. Daycares will uh, cease operations at the end of day tomorrow with certain exceptions. So again, the healthcare system has been at its highest level of preparedness. As Manitobans, we've been preparing. We see everyone implementing these social distancing strategies. We see many, many more people going to credible sources for information. And we see many people making these actions now. And so this is a, uh, uh, we are ahead of things now in Manitoba. We're going to continue to respond to this in that proactive manner. And uh, I thank uh, everyone from healthcare providers to all Manitobans who have chipped in uh, for their efforts against this, uh, this pandemic. So thank you very much. Thank you, Brent. And now to Lynette uh, Saragusa. Thank you. So I would like to first start off by acknowledging one of our teams that have been working extremely hard since uh, we had our first COVID-19 diagnosis. Um, so, and that is HealthLinks InfoSante. So when we started, HealthLinks was getting, um, they had 30 phone lines. They now have over 100. They were receiving about 350 calls a day. And now, as of yesterday, they received 2,130 calls in one day. They've had to quadruple their staffing, and they've brought in 100 nursing students and retired nurses and onboarded and educated them. They've taken over uh, the space in every boardroom and education training room and um, trying to adhere to the social distancing uh, requirements. And uh, I just want to acknowledge that uh, they have uh, made every effort possible. And I know there has been challenges with the technology, but it's not because of a lack of, of intent from the people. And I also wanted to say a big thank you to Ace Burpee and his team at Virgin 103 who bought dinner for the HealthLink staff with the help of his listeners. And uh, it was really well received and such a nice gesture. It lifted their spirits. And uh, it's just another great example of what a great province we all live in. So um, just to give you the rundown of the stats. So HealthLinks, as I said, they had 2,130 calls yesterday. The wait time was one hour and 36 minutes. Uh, we will be getting our interactive voice recording uh, set up later today. They've been testing yesterday and today. So that will help. The self-assessment tool online, since it launched on March 17th, which was, was that yesterday? Um, what, they had 150,000 hits to that. So hopefully um, that is helpful to people. And... Um, the Access Centre, as the Minister has announced, Selkirk had a soft launch yesterday, so they're up and running. Steinbach is coming on board tomorrow. Um, Brandon, Flin Flon, the Paw were earlier, Thompson. So um, in Steinbach, uh, it's supposed to open tomorrow. It will be a drive-through and open seven days a week from 9 till 3. So you can... Um, connect in there and see when when the details of where um, and then the other thing I just wanted to let you know is we're starting uh, this morning Dr. Rusin and I at our incident command approved a centralized COVID-19 contact and surveillance unit so we will have a core team of people who are going to follow up on those contacts they already do but they're going to be centralized we'll have a provincial patient registry on board and uh, make sure that we are 
are connected so we can follow patients throughout the trajectory, whether it's in the community and the hospital and, and uh, be able to report that to the Public Health Agency of Canada and onwards. So now um, I just wanted to let you know, we've talked a lot about the community resources in terms of health links and access centers, but I did want to let you know that we are, uh, we have been, but I'm going to share some information that we are really starting to focus on building up capacity in the acute sites for when that's required. So within the next 24 hours, you're going to see that the, we have restricted the visitor policy for the acute sites. We are now recommending no visitors. However, we will make exceptions um, for individual circumstances. At Children's Hospital, one parent or guardian will be allowed in at a time. For Cancer Care Manitoba, they will look at the situation on a case-by-case -case basis. Uh, HSC, as the minister spoke to, they are getting ready to build up a COVID-19 medicine unit and so uh, communication has gone to families and patients notifying them that we will be moving an existing unit to the old women's hospital and dedicating that unit to be our COVID-19 uh, making sure there's isolation and proper ventilation that's required there. And we've also uh, made an ask of the chief nursing officers and every RHA to um, develop an inventory of critical care nurses that uh, may have had recent experience or education uh, and maybe isn't working in critical care but may be accessible and available if we need help there. And I also want to say a special thank you to Doctors Manitoba. They've been uh, supporting us in the effort to um, uh, keep track of physicians who, who want to volunteer and I, I know right now they have 89 so we're working with our medical leadership to determine where best um, we can put them. So that's that's my update and I guess we can take yeah. questions. Yeah, to conclude, I would like to say that at this moment, we are asking a lot of Manitoba. This is not a normal situation. C'est une situation exceptionnelle euh, et je voudrais dire que c'est important à, à ce moment pour tous les Manitobains et tous les, tous les Manitobains à suivre les règles, laver les mains, rester à la maison quand, euh, si tu es malade, euh, euh, f -f -f faire des précautions, des précautions, euh, oui, euh, et, euh, et aussi sois gentil aux autres. Uh, uh, parce que nous sommes ici à ce moment ensemble. Uh, et puis, on dit merci à tout le monde pour les efforts. On continue, on fait des planifications et uh, uh, à ce moment, on dit seulement merci. Questions for anyone? The 30 bed, uh, this new unit, it's an isolation unit. They're going to make them isolation beds, yeah. Are we going to need more staffing for that? How much staff do, do we need to... Have that in place. Yeah, they're actually right now, we don't have any uh, in hospital at HSC, so we will be working out the staffing, but for right now, we're looking at moving in the equipment and the supplies. Absolutely, plain language, when you say no visitors to acute care sites, can you define all acute care sites, or what are acute care sites, will there be no visitors? Mm -hmm. All acute care sites in the province. Acute care sites for oh. people who hear that message and don't know what you mean by that. Yeah, no, that's a good question. Um, hospital facility based, other than personal care homes. All hospitals will have no visitors except for kids and you said cancer care. Uh, Correct, and there are some other exceptions as well. So they are, let me get them for you, uh, obstetrics, neonatal intensive care, pediatric intensive care and in an emergency or trauma situation we would we would uh, evaluate so there's a little bit of clinical judgment but overall we're saying no visitors to acute care hospital facilities we've had a lot of people coming to us essentially ratting people out about not following this isolation I know we talked to dr. Rusin yesterday some provinces now looking at the possibility of bringing 
sanctions or punishment for people that are being reckless or not following this? Is that something that we could see happen here? It's a quickly evolving situation and we know that people are being vigilant, uh, but some people think that their vigilance should also include, as you say, ratting out other people who aren't following the rules and we see some of that social shaming activity going on in, in online mediums as well. I think at this point we're calling for cooperation. We're calling for the judgment of Manitobans. Uh, we have not uh, contemplated at this moment any exceptional measures uh, but I would say everything's on the table in terms of our ongoing response to COVID-19 because we're in it together. What point would you consider a lockdown if say yeah I, I guess that is the question like what point would you consider a, a, like a, maybe a full lockdown or are you referring to a call for a state of emergency? Well, perhaps if that's what it would take to keep people, you know, out of bars, out of wherever, right? Like that sort of thing. So uh, I'll allow Brent to answer as well, but I would simply preamble to say that we have, uh, of course, called for some very significant uh, measures, and we are seeing uh, broad compliance by Manitobans. We've been impressed with the way things like restaurants and uh, other places have responded to limit or, or pause activities or close their shops in the meantime. We think that this has been effective until now. However, of course, uh, as the situation continues to evolve, all the options are on the table. We're mindful of, of what other provinces are doing, and I would say we are constantly sharing information with other jurisdictions, with the federal government, uh, because we know that our response uh, must uh, align. What about the state of emergency? We're dealing with the province that hasn't called one yet? It's not off the table. What circumstances would you bring that in? Well, I would say this, uh, just to, in terms of context, remember that in Ontario, they had their first case of COVID-19 in the last week of January, and then they called for a state of emergency two days ago. So in Manitoba, what we have said is that the things we are doing, are we're doing out of an abundance of caution. We are ahead of the game in some respects of other jurisdictions. Even to this date, uh, your chief just gave a report that indicated with 17 cases, uh, the vast majority of these are already concluded to be travel related. So we're acting in, a, in an abundance of caution. We're bringing changes. Uh, we are having all the options on the table, but we're keeping Manitobans safe. I don't know if it's Dr. Rusin or Lynette that can maybe answer this, but we've had a lot of readers and listeners calling in asking what they can do to help. If there's household items that maybe care homes, first responders could have that people might have at home that they could help out with, is, is there anything that people can do from home that's besides staying home that might yeah. help? Well, you know what? Let me put that out to our operations table and I will get back to you, Brittany. That's a really good question. And, and those are the kind of things we want to see, people coming together and, and supporting each other. At what point would we start considering testing people who do have symptoms but don't have travel history? We are opening more testing sites, so the capacity for testing is obviously getting larger. Right, so as of like right now, the capacity for testing isn't larger uh, uh, for us. Uh, as I uh, stated there, the national strains uh, through all the labs uh, are uh, are in place. So our lab is uh, is just like that, is a bit under strain. So what we would uh, what we do is we'll just look at uh, uh, at the cases. If we keep seeing a large proportion of our cases being travel related then we need to focus on the highest risk people to ensure that we're utilizing our capacity. But as things develop, then we, uh, we can expand more and more over, over time. But right now we're in a position where we need to focus on the most at risk uh, to identify those cases. Testing delays. Are all 17 still travel related? 16 are, are absolutely travel related. And the one I mentioned, um, we, we cannot uh, directly link it to travel at this point. Uh, you mentioned delays in getting test results done. How long is it taking to notify to, to process a test now and to notify positive people about it? So it depends. So as of today, um, there, there's going to be a, a bit of a, of a change. The lab is going to need to prioritize uh, hospital-based uh, hospital uh, people, people who are inpatients, healthcare workers, um, outbreaks or samples from uh, PCHs or from First Nations are going to be the priori uh, pri uh, prioritized. Uh, mildly ill people in the community, um, though those uh, might be delayed by, uh, uh, by a few days. We're getting questions from 
moms to be who are pregnant right now who are worried um, anything that you can tell us about if they're more susceptible or a mom who is almost ready to give birth right now and things that they might need to know so we know that uh, pregnant women are more susceptible to complications related to the flu and this is a uh, various uh, various reasons for this so uh, so I would say that they should take uh, the precautions uh, to heart that we're describing here ensuring social distancing um, and those that are nearing term, I would, uh, they should follow the, the advice uh, from their practitioners uh, on, uh, on appointments and the need for those. Uh, but certainly, uh, just like other uh, uh, of the higher risk uh, individuals that we talk about, uh, certainly those over 65, medical conditions, uh, immune compromise, need to be extra vigilant and the people around them need to be extra vigilant uh, to ensure uh, we're not spreading this virus. When we look at these being travel related right now, uh, there's that two, f two meters before and after, so a couple rows on an airplane where people are being you know, alerted and having to look for possible symptoms. Uh, we're hearing possibility of some uh, transit buses right now that are being quarantined because of a possible driver who may have had this. Does that exacerbate the situation when you could have, you know, 50 people on that bus that then might need to be alerted? Well, so th all of these things are considered and all of these are, um, are safeguarded in our social distancing strategies. Uh, right, so we realize that as more and more of the virus is introduced into our province, we're uh, very likely going to start seeing the community-based transmission. It's tough to predict when that's going to occur, uh, so we came out ahead of it. Uh, and so, washing your hands, staying home when you're sick, uh, keeping that social distancing. Uh, so we don't say keep social distance from sick people. We're saying keep social distancing from everyone. And so these are all built in to limit the, the, the spread of that virus, to uh, stop that, uh, um, th that spread, even on people we might not uh, uh, recognize to be ill. That may be difficult on a bus, though, when you're given a situation of... Yeah, but the, the social distancing, the st recommendation is to limit all those type of exposures, right? So, um, uh, so when you're on that bus, so remember if this is not an airborne spread, this is spread through close contact with a sick person, so if you're sitting somewhere on that bus and the driver's two meters from you, 50 people on that bus are not exposed to that virus. Just to remind you, the media the minister has about five more minutes for us to leave. What's, yeah. what's the benefits of these drive-through um, facilities, uh, testing facilities? And, and will a lot of them going forward <clears throat> excuse me, be that as well? Yeah, so I think they have a number of uh, benefits. Uh, the one is that we're not bringing a bringing a potentially ill person inside a building and cohorting them with other people. You know, even though precautions are taken, uh, so that's that's probably the biggest uh, biggest benefit. We don't have to get somebody inside a building with with other people. Is it possible to do that in France, Mr. President? Is, uh, is that possible? It's clear that they are more than four times. Uh, pour, uh, pour les, les peuples, les gens uh, qui pensent qu'ils qu sont malades, uh, de rester à la voiture, rester uh, uh, dans son propre voiture. Uh, autrement, on entre dans un centre uh, avec les autres qui sont malades, uh, mais aussi on continue à, à essayer des nouvelles choses. Uh, c'est pas exactement clair. C'est uh, quoi le meilleur uh, la meilleure façon uh, et, et puis on continue à essayer et, et chaque jour on devient meilleur. I'm hearing anecdotally in the community that uh, they appreciate the ongoing updates from the government uh, and the uh, uh, ongoing efforts to strengthen uh, that service. As I told you, we went from 35 lines to 104 lines. We've added a lot of human resources to help staff those lines. We've added the uh, online assessment tool to divert traffic and we've acted that uh, and we've activated as well that IVR technology to help deliver that we're keeping those times at about two hours people understand it's busy but let me take this opportunity to underscore one thing that Dr. Roussin said which is essential the capacity that we have for health links and the capacity that we have uh, especially for the community testing sites uh, 
is capacity that we must reserve for those who need it. Do not be using info links as a kind of an everyday general information line for this, that, and the other thing. We have an excellent resource at Public Health, uh, that online tool people can read, they can find specific information. It's a compendium of information available on your device or on your computer, and we all must uh, have a role in keeping the capacity for health links and also uh, for the community screening sites for what they're most needed for. Mr. Grayson, has any updates been given on daycares and uh, details to do with helping families out in that regard? A lot of people saying they're still having to pay for that spot to keep it and, and a lot of parents that are worried. There's a lot of unknowns. Clearly we are moving quickly as other jurisdictions are, are moving quickly. Uh, Minister Stephenson, the Minister for Families, has uh, undertaken a, uh, just an awful lot of work with her key leadership t uh, team uh, to be able to advance this. We felt that there was a benefit to families of providing them the advance notice notice of the impending closure. Uh, that was not available in all jurisdictions and we know that many families are planning even right now. We are seeing that the volumes in both childcare and in our educational settings are declining, showing that parents are making plans. There are some unknowns clearly at this point. Uh, we're hoping to provide an update soon when it comes to childcare. Fair note, can you provide an update for the healthcare workers uh, that are supposed to be getting special assistance? So we, Dr. Rusin and I and our HR lead met with the Department of Families yesterday to talk about, so letters have gone out uh, to everyone, um, healthcare workers and, and all parents, uh, to identify um, where, where their children are and, and if they have plans. So we will work with the individual sites uh, in terms of essential workers and making sure that those children have spots. So we're, uh, we're letting the Department of Families take the lead and then it, when as we develop and uh, see where our pressure points are, we'll connect with them on solutions. Do you change the HSC? Um, this is, sounds like the first in kind of a series of moves, as mentioned. Uh, what are the other changes going to look like after this 30-bed isolation unit? Uh, well, we're going to start with that, and again, we don't have any uh, acute medicine patients at this time, so it's really about staffing it up, making sure we have our processes and everything we need so when that first patient, if and when they come, that we're ready to go. And then there are a series of other plans in the works, and I can give you more updates as they as they, they develop. So, Minister Friesen, we had that. Yeah. Sorry. Thanks very much. Thank you, you, everyone. Thank you. Thank you. Uh, Ms. Sergey, so just uh, some criticism about the, the change on March 15th or after March 15th of the policy where returning healthcare workers did or didn't have to isolate for 14 days. Can you just explain the, the decision, the change there? So the direction was that everyone who returned from international travel, including healthcare workers, needed to self-isolate for 14 days. There are some health workers who are deemed essential, and some of them where there's only two or three who know how to do something. And uh, so if, if it was the case that we needed them in the healthcare system, it's uh, the process is that they would call their direct supervisor. Uh, it would be approved by an executive at the hospital that this was indeed an uh, irreplaceable essential worker. If they were asymptomatic, they would they could go to work with a mask um, and be and ensure that they are not in contact with our highest risk immunocompromised patients and they would be followed by occupational health is, is contract uh, contact tracing being done for the cases that have been um, you know, found presumptive or confirmed? Absolutely. So we, uh, we move on each presumptive positive test immediately, inform the, the case, ensure that they're self-isolating, and then immediately move to extensive contact investigation. And so each contact will be investigated, um, symptom review, and advised to self-isolate, followed up each day. Does that happen with airlines? Like, I mean, are you with airlines, people that were on those flights? Would they be contacted if they were on you know, international travel? We uh, certainly had been uh, doing that. Uh, what we found was that uh, international uh, uh, airlines we have not seen despite having cases on board of there we have not seen documented transmission on there so it was in fact a lower risk. Um, however uh, when we find contacts um, we advise them to self-isolate for 14 days. All international travelers 
need to isolate for 14 days. So whether you're on a plane or not, you need to, uh, or if you're on that plane, whether you're a contact or not, you need to isolate for 14 days. So it's the, the work involved with getting that uh, um, itinerary is, is probably um, uh, more than what's needed. Sir, so can you confirm that nursing students are testing, or screening rather, people walking to hospitals? Is that actually happening? I can't confirm that, but I can look into it for you. How many people showed up at the Selkirk drive through yesterday? For speeding, I heard nine. I can I can get back on the number for you. It wasn't it wasn't a high. I think there was there was a, a small number that came and an even smaller number that got tested. And and why Selkirk? Why Selkirk? Um, you know what? We left that to the regional health authorities to determine where the necessary sites were based on the population need, and that was the first one that they developed. Can you confirm anything about these quarantine buses? Do you know anything about the situation that's going on with that? I have not been notified of those. Uh, that was probably dealt with at the at the regional level, if that's uh, occurring, if it came from public health. But I have not been notified of that. What about um, deeming other staff that aren't necessarily medical people as an essential service? Let's say you know people working at grocery stores or providing like food, water, shelter. Would you ever consider? Um, giving them that so they can get the same benefit? Well, we're looking, uh, we review these things all the time, and like, like I said, this it's evolving rapidly, and we make decisions sometimes without perfect information, and when you make uh, um, decisions, you, there, you're aware often of unintended consequences, but sometimes others come up. So it's the same thing with the, with the daycares. Um, a lot of uh, uh, people feel it was a, an obvious thing to, to shut down daycares, um, but it's obvious until you realize that it puts such a strain on your health care workforce. Uh, and other essential services. So there's a lot of uh, decisions going uh, on with this. So certainly we've made exceptions to the self-isolation for um, uh, uh, people who cross the border to uh, ensure the ongoing um, transport of goods and services. So truck drivers can't self-isolate each and every time they return with a load. Uh, and so um, these are the type of things we would we would look at. Ms. Sergis, could you uh, go into a little bit more detail about the EU? Uh, nurses are being asked to do more and they've offered, forgive me, I, mi I missed part of that. Nurses that have which specific skills are, are volunteering to do what precisely? Uh, were you asking about student nurses? Regular nurses. You had said you had identified towards the end of your address uh, nurses that have Oh, critical care. critical care. Yeah. Of them, no, said? 89 physicians have um, identified themselves through Doctors Manitoba uh, to be available to help support. And how many nurses have offered to do more? We just put out the call yesterday to the chief nursing officers to uh, identify and get an inventory of where their critical care trained or experienced nurses are. Are the doctors retired doctors? Is that what you said? You know, I didn't, I don't know the status. I, I would assume some of them are. I'm not sure of the specific details of who volunteered. But they don't be licensed. Yeah, you know what? Everybody has to be licensed. Retired, yeah. No international doctors with foreign credentials or anything? Uh, I, I can't, I wouldn't, uh, I don't think we're bringing anyone in who isn't licensed well, with their colleges. Now. Yeah, if they're here already, they might be internationally trained, yeah, but... Yeah. We've been told that there's, of, between HSC and St. B, which have clinical rotations, one's canceled clinical rotations, the other hasn't. Uh, why is that? Yeah, that's a, a regional health authority, so that's under the WRHA. Uh, they made that decision, but uh, we are in conversations with the University of Manitoba about um, student placements, uh, their clinical rotations, and um, so, yeah, more to come on that. I have a specific question for Dr. Roos, and um, this is for a specific story, so forgive me. Uh, there's so much misinformation going around. What would your reaction be if you heard about somebody advertising an herbal tea that prevents COVID-19? So there is no uh, effective proven therapy for COVID-19 right now. So uh, I would go to uh, credible sources. I would not um, um, you know, take anyone up on any of these uh, uh, offers for, um, uh, for prevention or cure of it. You talked about there being a blood shortage. Uh, you said we're not in a blood crisis right now, but has there been any discussion about possibly changing or lifting some of the restrictions on blood donations so we can get more people in? Not to my knowledge. Of, of the 17 cases so far, how many are confirmed? 
the um, so that is still coming from the national uh, lab, and and I believe that uh, um, uh, they are sent off to the national lab back in. I believe that we have nine now that are confirmed at the um, uh, at the lab. What is that? Seventeenth case, if you don't know, is it, why is that still under investigation? Well, because there was um, uh, there was travel involved, um, but we can't necessarily link it to uh, uh, to travel for for uh, various reasons, and so you know. I've been committed to to transparency, so I want to you know to come out as soon as I know that we're we're unable to link it yet to tra to travel or to another case. I wanted to be transparent uh, as soon as I could, uh, and that may change uh, with further investigation. Have any been linked to each other? These um, uh, just in people who travel together. Were any living in a personal care home or no? Um, can you just? I, I forgive me. I know I didn't ask. What? How many? Because we're getting complaints from, not complaint, I mean, people are freaked out, so you can understand, they're, they're worried, but people who have been tested and haven't heard back, and you've said there are delays in testing, can you, can you give a maximum number of days? So yeah, and I mean, this is something we, we, we fully understand, and, but you, if you look at the, uh, the vast increase in amount of testing, when, you, when, we, when I mentioned that they tested 535 samples in a, in a given day, um, that's 500 negative tests that have to get called out uh, to somebody. And so that takes a long time, and I'm sure people can appreciate that we have to focus on the positives. We have to focus on the contact investigation, um, and there's so many moving parts right now. So I certainly understand that anxiety. Somebody's gotten tested. They're at home self-isolating and waiting. Um, and so we're going to do uh, what we can to try to speed that up. We have a few things in the works. So... Um, but, but I hope people understand that given those sheer numbers, we, we have to focus on those positives and get public health in action on those right now. And people need to wait until they get that positive or negative before they decide it's been five days. Clearly, I haven't been called, so I'm all good. Ab absolutely. So if you were, uh, if you were uh, underwent testing, um, then you should be self-isolating pending a negative result. Uh, and then so I note on that the connection to what I've talked about is if you weren't having symptoms you shouldn't have been tested. If you were asymptomatic, got tested, and waiting for a negative result, you are, um, you know, um, you're, you're waiting probably unnecessarily, uh, you're tested probably unnecessarily. So this is very important to be uh, testing um, the right people, and 500 uh, people who are returned international travelers who are symptomatic seems like a very high number in Manitoba for that, uh, that have that many. So we are seeing unnecessary tests being done. Could you, I don't know if you can do this in a quick manner, but just take us through what a day for you looks like. Well, well our day uh, is um, is really in the incident management uh, structure. So, so we start off with briefings with um, with officials, and then move into our command table uh, section, where issues from each uh, um, logistics, operations, planning, and finance bring up their issues for approval at that table. Um, and through there, then we break into each of those tables and then meet again at the command later on to approve further things. So, um, and then, of course, I, I'm involved with uh, meetings at the um, FPT level with our special advisory committee as well. This isn't a nine to five, like you're working. Yeah, there's. Well, I mean, it's it's certainly not about me. There's a there's probably a list a mile long of people working day and night on on this. And so, yeah, it's it's not a nine to five job right now. Quick yes or no question. Did the person who was admitted to hospital for mild symptoms who was COVID-19 positive, did that person have pre-existing conditions? I don't know. I just have really quick questions. How, uh, how good are masks? Because uh, I've heard uh, different things about them. People say, well, they're only good for so long. When, you know, like I look after my dad who lives at home, and I, you know, I want to just know what I can do to make sure I protect my dad. Right, so, the, uh, so for the general public, uh, we're, we're not advising the use of the masks um, for people who aren't ill. And so, and that's uh, one of, for that very reason, is that sometimes a use of a mask, if you don't, it could make it worse uh, if you're not using it properly. So healthcare workers, certainly using it in appropriate circumstances. People who are ill being provided a mask is appropriate. Uh, but the general public, we're not advising to use masks. They have a cold or they feel they have a cold, but they don't think they have and they want to get some groceries, do they wear a mask? My, my advice is to stay home if you're ill. Okay, what about um, how long can the virus last on 
a surface? So there's reports that it can last for many days on a surface. Those reports are uh, finding and detecting the virus on a surface. That doesn't necessarily tell us it's infectious for that long, but we, we, we have to expect that it can be found on surfaces, it can be prolonged, so uh, lots of hand washing. And what about people being outside? When you say they're isolated, are they allowed to be outside? Not in public. Uh, you know, if you're self-isolating, you should be at home. So certainly in your in your yard and things. But um, if you're your dog? not in public, no, you, know, you can walk them in your backyard, I imagine. But uh, but not in public. If you're self-isolating, you should be at home. In your yard. Okay. Not in not in public. Somebody asked about N95 masks. Are those useful or are easily available? I, I I don't I don't know anything about what an N95 mask is, but. Did, did you want to take I can, that? I can speak to it. So the N95 masks are a higher grade quality mask for um, which we, uh, if you look at the evidence, uh, whether it come from the World Health Organization or the Public Health Agency of Canada, uh, Ontario, BC, Alberta, they use these N95 masks for uh, procedures that have aerosol generating medical procedures. So if there's, there's uh, stuff flying in the air, the N95 would protect the healthcare worker. We don't need the N95 for regular screening and, and for that we just use a surgical mask, uh, gown and gloves and that, that is, evidence would suggest that is the protection that's required. So we have a, a stock of both the surgical masks for the low the droplet and contact precautions and we have the N95 for the aerosol. Work for the gen like would the N95 work for the general public to ward against getting the coronavirus? Well, the general public probably isn't instigating aerosol generating medical procedures, so it might be overkill for the general public. Uh, they could probably do with the surgical mask, if even that. If they're if they're sick, they should be home. So, um, what measures are you taking to ensure that inmates in Prisons, remand centers, holding facilities don't transmit at close quarters. Yeah, through our incident management structure, we're connected with each of the uh, ministries through um, uh, through government, and uh, and justice has been working on their plans for this. Have there been any further changes to uh, home care, uh, the way people are going into homes or so personal protection? Yeah, they're continuing to uh, work through their processes. So they've, uh, they're now working on a script so that home care workers can call before they enter a home and just do the screening themselves with the patient to say if they have flu symptoms, if they've traveled, and determine what the risk is and if they maybe shouldn't be going into that home. They also, uh, all health care providers have been uh, given information about personal practice protective equipment and they should have that available. If they don't, they should be talking to their manager and making sure it is available. And um, and then just like every uh, service that we provide, we are looking at what is essential service. So that hasn't changed as of yet, but with everything, uh, depending on where this goes, we want to just be prepared for what is essential that we must do and what are some things we can maybe put on hold or delay for a little bit. So those conversations are happening, no decisions at this point. Anything else? All right, thanks everyone. Thank, Thank you. you. Thank you.